The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Lennox Capital Partners Proprietary Limited, ABN 19617001966, AFSL 498737, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services, or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up over the Ensemble platform. All the information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. This episode is brought to you by Fedante. Fedante provides investors with access to best-in-class investment managers and is one of Australia's largest active investors, offering compelling strategies across equities, fixed income and alternative assets via partnerships with leading investment teams. Today's episode features Lennox Capital Partners, an active investment manager with a focus on the leaders of tomorrow. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager. On this day, don't worry about that, I represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset classes that are not only appropriate, uh, but also that work for those clients of yours as well. And this is important work that we do, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, to helping you through this journey and also to getting the feedback from uh, advisors as we go through this too. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic idea by Ensemble. And thank you so much for Morningstar for all of the help that they've given us uh, up to this point and for the help that they will give us going forward. So I hope that through this series, we can help answer some of those questions that we've come up with um, on the Ensemble platform. Keep the questions coming and keep the conversation going because that's what it's all about. And obviously, and here we go, all information contained in this podcast and all future podcasts is general in nature. You know the drill. This week, we're all about small caps, and I could not think of a better two guests to get into it with uh, than, first off, Jody Fitzgerald, Head of Institutional Portfolio Management and Solutions at Morningstar, and Liam Donoghue, Principal and Portfolio Manager at Lennox Capital Partners. Before that, he was the Portfolio Manager at MacBank for about 11 and a half years. Uh, Lennox Capital Partners is a specialist small cap, micro cap, specialist small and micro cap equities manager one of the boutique fund managers under the Fedante Partners umbrella. If you wanted some small caps experts, if you want some experts, we got them for you. Uh, if you wanted a good host, well, he was busy and we had to get me. So, Jody, Liam, how are you now? Good, thanks. How are you? Not so bad. Liam, you yeah, there? Doing very, very well, thanks, James, and thanks for that introduction. That was uh, one of the most exciting introductions I think I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where the script runs out. Now I've got nothing else to talk about after that. So, so let's Excellent. Let, let, Look, just joking, like I said, uh, this podcast is about answering all the questions about small caps that are being asked on the Ensemble platform, obviously. Keep those questions coming. Let's start at the beginning. I've mentioned small caps. I've mentioned micro caps. What do we actually mean by small caps? And what does a small cap business typically look like? For example, are they skewed towards tech, services, mining? Liam, it's it's one of my classic open-ended questions, um, mate. Have at it. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting thing to think about, I suppose, in terms of what a small cap actually is, because things tend to change so frequently in that part of the market. But the easiest starting point is that a small cap is any stock outside the ASX 100. So that's that's the most simple classification. But then if we think about what the average small company looks like and some of its its typical features, the small ordinaries benchmark is a good guide for that sort of thing. And that index tells us 
that the average small company has a market cap or equity value in terms of its size of almost two and a half billion dollars. So uh, that's B for Bob, by the way. Um, so quite a, quite a large business, billion. Yeah, that's right, billions. Yeah. Um, and the business itself, typically an industrial business, although there are some um, you know mining and energy businesses in there as well. They've typically got a founder or one of the initial investors that are still quite heavily involved in the business in some capacity. And generally speaking, it's probably growing a bit faster than the broader market. So that's, you know, when we think about small caps, that probably summarises what the typical small company usually looks like. Thanks for that, Liam. Now, I just want to take a step back, talk about the the macro context, a little bit bigger picture, the macro context for small caps, because it's quite different to what we've seen over the last few years. So, Jody, I'll put this to you. Exactly what is the macro context? What does it mean for small caps? What does it mean for advice and portfolio construction more broadly? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, that is a very big, broad question you've asked me. So <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks. I'll, I'll take it in numerous directions, I guess. Um, I think be, before we get into the where are we at and where we're going, I think it's good to reflect on where we've been um, and the way portfolios have probably been built over the last decade, um, the, the shift needs to change effectively. So when you have a look at what happened prior to inflation and interest rate rises uh, occurring in, in the market cycle, we've had an extraordinarily long period of time of perpetually falling interest rates and low market volatility. So what really won in that environment was effectively just having a market exposure, so having a beta exposure, um, and really passive investing won out over that last decade. But as we step into a period where the outcomes of markets are no longer being, I guess, rigged, if we want to call it that, by by central banks, by artificially holding interest rates low, we're actually moving into what I'd refer to as a more normal market environment. The last decade or so was not normal. So moving into a period where we actually have interest rates above zero, where we actually have some inflation, and we actually have volatility returning to the marketplace. It means that understanding total portfolio risk is more critical now than it has been for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And I think what's going to be absolutely uh, important for advisors to understand is that some risk exposures in portfolios, it's going to be really important to make sure you've got those calibrated appropriately. You didn't need to think about it a lot over the last decade because basically all tides were rising effectively, but that's not the case anymore. And this is really where we think active management and finding skilled managers who have uh, capabilities in different asset segments is going to be really important, but then also understanding how to size different opportunities in a portfolio. So that's kind of, I I think, understanding that context is important because talking about where we're at in the rate cycle is only relevant in the sense of, you know, what does it mean for the way you construct portfolios and 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 does anything need to change? Um, look, I think I'll tell you one thing I know for certain is that any forecast I make will be wrong. Um, so you can sort of bank that. But what we do in understanding the macro environment is understanding the paths that we could take from here and the impacts of those paths on portfolios. This is actually probably, as far as I can remember, the longest, most widely accepted telecast you know, recession <laughs> that hasn't actually occurred. And most major market economies have been dodging that uh, recession. So the question then becomes, where are we at in the rate cycle? Does the Do central banks need to keep increasing interest rates to fight inflation? Has the heavy lifting been done? And what is the probability of us moving into an economic downturn that would then out- impact the way you allocate assets? From that perspective, a lot of discussion around inflation has been probably misfocused on supply chain issues and the impact of COVID and the impact of the Ukraine war. And while that certainly has played a role in some of the inflation, a lot of supply and demand imbalances eventually worked their way out of the system. The issue that we've had in some major economies, particularly like the US, for example, has actually just been a good old fashioned overheating economy where we've got extremely low unemployment. We've got more job openings than unemployed people who are able to actually fill those job openings, that then puts pressure on wages. Um, Unfortunately, the only way to get wage inflation under control is to deliberately increase interest rates and slow the economy. And that's effectively what most global central banks have been doing. 
Where we're at from an inflationary perspective, the reality is even though headline inflation is coming down globally, and certainly the monetary policy uh, moves that we've seen over the last 18 months that are having an impact, core inflation is still elevated and is still above the target of most central banks. So core inflation is effectively, it strips out those volatile items like uh, food and energy, and it's a more representative understanding of the general trend of prices, and it's what the central banks will, and you know, including the RBA, will focus on. Mm. So we thought core inflation above that typical 2 to 3 band, percent band that most central banks will target, it's difficult to see how central banks could start cutting rates. So do you think the market's getting it wrong, or is it pricing in a possible recession? So what's perverse about this, right, is that the market is saying there's going to be a recession, we're going to start getting interest rate cuts, that's going to be fabulous, and the stock market has charged ahead, which is really, really interesting because effectively, you know, the overarching concern there is that even though interest rate risk may have repriced in markets, have the earnings expectations been repriced for a potential slowing of the economy. And that is a real question mark at the moment as to whether or not that is being appropriately, um, you know, considered uh, across assets. And we're here to talk about small caps today. And and if anything, I think a lot of that valuation or earnings risk is probably being better priced in that part of the market than it has in, in the large caps, most definitely. But What's going to be important for advisors is understanding that not all risk is equal anymore like it was over the last decade and that it will be really important to understand how you calibrate your risk, making sure you have exposures to active managers that are specialised in in particular areas um, and that having capital at work in the market is simply not going to be enough. Yeah, I I think that we can declare the reign of Queen Tina uh, over um, we did enjoy investing during her reign, and uh, and that was fantastic. But now that there are alternatives, Tina being the there are, there is no alternative, which is yep. sort of the mantra for a lot of the advisory space, especially in the fund management space, um, for, for in in that area. As you said, that passive area of just going and just buying the market and being the market was a fairly easy, safe place to hide, and has been a, yep. and has been a good hiding spot for a lot of people for a long time, myself included. The uh, now that that reign has gone, it it is definitely. Uh, time to start getting picky and fussy. It's also time to sort of move. I I try and do it sort of like a left and right, and it's not going to work for the interest of the podcast, but I move sort of on this left and right side, left being the safest area, right being the riskiest area, I guess you could say. And now that you can have more of a portfolio sitting in that left side of near risk-free area with a return, which actually makes sense, you can start to move more things out of that right side. It means that you do, um, just summarising exactly what you said, Jody. that's my expertise, The uh, it means that it means that the things that you have on that right side and in that middle side can be more picky about who it is that you choose. Now, let's, now the, every portfolio or most portfolios need to have some sort of an allocation to a diverse uh, set of asset classes. One of those asset classes is, uh, uh, small caps um, that it could be depending on what is appropriate for the client. I, I can't say that, but the I can't say what isn't appropriate for everyone's client. That's sort of not the deal that we do. However, many do have an appropriateness and a level for that in the small cap space. Where where do small caps fit in on a standard long term profile? Just so that we can all make sure that we're on the same page. Now we've got. Aussie small caps and international. So let's just make it as easy as possible on what we're talking about and just talk about local stuff here. Yep, sure. Yeah, I think um, I think it's really important to understand that when you're actually building out sort of your risk profiles, what you the the key area that you're concerned with is the the path, I guess, um, to to the end destination. So assets with higher levels of volatility are obviously more appropriate for those with longer timeframes and you know higher growth asset exposures. And what you're seeking in your more defensive areas or, or for investors with shorter timeframes is a, is a lower level of volatility. Mm. So given that small caps are um, fairly well leveraged to a market cycle and therefore can be expected to display higher levels of volatility through a cycle. Um, it probably, you know, from our perspective, when we're doing our allocations in portfolios, we tend to use small caps in the higher risk profiles and not so much in the lower risk profiles. In the lower risk profiles, we'll allow our sort of, you know, our large cap equity managers who might sort of like dabble down into that space when the valuation opportunities exist. But a permanent allocation to more volatile assets like small caps in lower risk 
profiles can sort of, you know, is not necessarily wise. Using it as a tactical allocation, so if there's a real valuation opportunity in having a small allocation potentially, but then you're trying to time market cycles. So, you know, from our perspective, we think, you know, sticking to the, you know, balanced and above type profiles um, for, for your um, small cap allocations. All right. Well, what I'm going to do now, so we've, we've, now that we've sort of understood the uh, the framework in which we're working, I'm going to bring in Liam Donahue, Donahue, sorry, Principal and Portfolio Manager at Lennox Capital Partners. I introduced him before, but we may as well do it again. He's been he's been listening in. I mean, there's no secret. He's he was introduced at the top of the damn show. Sorry about that, uh, Liam. <laughs> welcome back. Welcome back in now. Um, <laughs> Thank the, you. First off, let's just go into your history and 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 how you sort of managed to wind up. I mean, let's. Let's steer clear of the full origin story about some event in school, if you can. But um, sort of sure, just sure, sure. your path, your path in the industry. I'm always interested in that because there's always something in there that's like, and now I'm doing this, and there's always that little crux of aha. That's uh, let's 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 see if we can pick that open. Yeah, sure, absolutely, and uh, thanks again for having me, James, and uh, good day, Jody, as well. Um, but in terms of my background, I, I was lucky enough when I was uh, just finishing up my uh, university studies to have a a mate at the local footy club who was a recruitment agent. And uh, and just when I was finishing, he said, uh, there's actually a few jobs going. I'll, I'll put you forward um, to a couple of uh, businesses that you might be interested in. One of those was Macquarie Bank. At the time, it was still a bank, not a group. And uh, and the, the role was in risk management. Um, and initially, I, I thought that sounded a bit dry. But um, what I came to learn in terms of risk management and this particular role, uh, which was in funds management risk, is that I got to see, or well, that role, which ultimately I, I did secure, uh, got exposure to absolutely every different asset class. So equities, which is ultimately where I I, uh, I landed and found the specific interest, but fixed income, cash, private equity, currency, uh, real estate investing, all of those areas I got sort of behind the scenes access to in terms of that risk management position out of yeah. university. So it was a Fantastic starting point, but ultimately confirmed what I'd always thought, which was that equities was where I wanted to land. So moved across to uh, the Aussie Equities Fundamental Team at Macquarie, where I worked for ten or so years, a bit over. Um, and and probably the aside from learning the trade at Macquarie, which is a fantastic place to uh, to work, a lot of very clever people and a lot of good friends coming out of that. Uh, probably the most important connection for me was with uh, what what ultimately became my business partner, James Doherty, who. Uh, I worked with uh, for several years at Macquarie, uh, who at a point in time of both of our careers, um, we decided that that the way forward for us was to go out on our own, uh, leave the mothership of Macquarie uh, and and try funds management as a standalone entity. So James and I both left uh, Macquarie to start Lennox Capital Partners uh, in 2017 and uh, and we haven't looked back since so no that was that was that was important that was an important way of, of kicking that one off and it's, it's funny that you mentioned that about risk managing risk and being uh, getting that cutting your teeth in that risk area because yes. uh, if there's something that everyone learns eventually and not that I'm the old head of the in, in in any room that I walk into I try not to be I try to be the guy that's asking the questions <laughs> not telling people but I mean managing money is in in effect, really just managing risk, and yeah, if you can absolutely. get the get the handle on that, then capital preservation continues to be something that you can actually maintain, which is the first priority, or at least it is for me, um, yeah. and I'm sure that it is for you as well. The, yeah, yes, spot on. So, in terms of investment process, how do you go about assessing small cap stocks? Now, I suppose that just by way of background, um, our investment process overall is is absolutely focused on bottom up stock selection and. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's great to have Jody's um, uh, view and, and well-spoken opinion in terms of the, the macro, because that's absolutely something that that I would put my hand up and say, I don't have any sort of specialisation in that area. I, I don't form a view on um, interest rates, recession, inflation, those sorts of macro areas. There are people much smarter than me that have a view on those things like Jody, um, and, and I'm more than happy to, to leave that uh, out of our process. But what we absolutely do focus on is some of those areas that are at times critical to certain businesses, how do they impact on a specific business? Because that's really where we are focused. Um, what, are, what do those areas do to the business? What does the market do to the business? What do competitors do to that business? How does that business respond? How do they turn a profit? And then ultimately for us, 
what are they worth and and is there some valuation opportunity there for our investors so in terms of in terms of taking that view we are absolutely bottom up and how we uh, how we conduct that research as a starting point for us is to get out of the office which um, again as Jody touched on the past decade or so when interest rates have been really low or falling to a really low uh, state uh, it, it has been quite difficult to differentiate yourself against, you know, potentially um, index trackers or computers uh, or just broad market exposure. But our view is that ultimately by doing something a little bit different um, to, to those types of investors, ultimately we'll get rewarded. And, and our little bit different, I suppose, um, is to be out pounding the pavement, meeting people running these businesses, having face-to-face conversations with them, sitting across a table going out to see their factories, seeing their shop fronts um, and understanding what makes these people tick um, and how they are going to um, ultimately grow and and build their business into a, a successful business that, you know, at some point in the future may actually become a, a, a very large company as opposed to purely staying a small company. So is the process you go through, the due diligence you need to do, is that different for different small cap companies uh, because... They don't have the track record. It's difficult to get the track record or they don't have as much data to look at as more established companies, obviously. I mean, that's a pretty it's a pretty obvious one. But sort of I'd, I'd love to know some more of the detail behind that. Uh, and, and, and this is a, a, a big one that we've got off the platform. What are the proxies that you can use for the likely success of a small cap business? You don't have the data, but what's the way that you can sort of have a measurement to, to, to know and it's sort of, you know, just, just an alternative that you can have. The proxy, I suppose, is the best way of describing that. And yeah. there you go. There's a, few, there's a few to unpack here for you. On a related note, are higher interest rates doing the job for you in terms of sorting the wheat from the chaff, forcing the more marginal businesses out? We'll come around back to that one again, but um, I, I'm really just looking at at, at the data question to, uh, to tee off. Sure, sure. Yeah, and that that is a very... Uh... Very dense question there in terms of uh, content, and, and for the for the last bit, the, the interest rates. Um, I, I think that probably is a, a fair comment in terms of um, higher interest rates are doing a little bit of that work. In terms of um, there's no doubt when when money is effectively freeze, you know, zero interest rates, probably lower quality businesses can survive um, in that they have access to cheap funding. Higher interest rates obviously make that a bit more difficult. Um, but but I suppose coming back to to sort of the main thrust of the question in terms of um, how we uh, how we work through the process and and you know key areas that we're looking to identify um, to try and help us um, ourselves sort the wheat from the chaff. I suppose um, the the main things that we do and probably the you know the main uh, area that we spend time on as small cap managers. Um, is getting out of the office and meeting with businesses and management teams and people involved in small companies. We typically do over 500 of those meetings a year, so it is a big chunk of our workload. But that's because in small caps, uh, you absolutely have to get out there and do the work yourself. Um, You compare it to large caps where um, there's a lot of uh, stockbroker or sell-side research coverage. Um, Mm. You know, for some businesses, you can just go back and look at their last 30 annual reports and and understand the history of the business and the people involved. But in small companies, you tend not to have that luxury. So you, you actually need to get out of the office, be on the ground and meet with these people and these businesses. So... In terms of what we look for for small businesses, the the key points for us really relate to uh, the people involved and how they're incentivized and aligned because that can be a really good indicator for where the business is heading uh, directionally in terms of earnings and profitability. Um, the second point for us is is sustainability or ESG, um, and and for businesses that's really important now because. ESG is absolutely a real part of any company's future now and and something that has to be contemplated and planned for. Um, So that's a really important part of the business to understand. And then thirdly, the quality of the company's earnings is really important in terms of our ability as uh, investors to understand how powerful that business's profitability is um, and then then try and forecast that into future years because that feeds heavily into our view on uh, what we think the company is worth, those future earnings. So, so they're probably the key areas that you need to understand in small caps. But um, as you mentioned, it really is something that you have to be out there doing yourself firsthand because there's there's not really anyone there that can do that sort of work for you. 
yeah, well, that's that's why that's I suppose that's why people pay you to do what you need to do. Um, there's no way that an individual investor or even an advisor could do that many uh, do that many company meetings and actually sort of get to get to the bare bones of exactly what's going on around the entire market and still do their actual job. That's why. Yeah, exactly right. That's why we have the funds doing what they do. Oh, cheers, mate. Uh, okay, I want to talk briefly about performance strategy. So, okay, Liam, I love the fact that we've got a small ordinaries index. I, I do love saying the small ordinaries index. It makes you sound important. Tell us what that's made up of because we've got to talk about benchmarking. We've got to talk about indexing. Um, what's the small ordinaries index? This is one of those classic questions. What's the index made up of? Uh, how has it trended over the short and long term? And is it relevant? And then yeah, there's, the, there's the kicker question. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> the relevance of the small ordinaries index. That's a very cutting question from one of our advisors there. It, it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a very pointed question, and I'll, uh, I'll try not to entirely take the bait there. Um, but, but what I would definitely say is that um, it, I'm just bearing in mind that I'm obviously a fundamental active small cap manager, I've got a pretty vested interest in, in the discussion and, and, um, and whether the benchmark's relevant, whether this part of the market's relevant, which I absolutely believe it is. Um, but I suppose from my perspective, I think it's a pretty difficult index um, to try and replicate in terms of, um, you know, an ETF or an index tracking investment for the small cap market. And, and there's a range of reasons for that, like lower liquidity that everyone knows exists in small caps. But actually also um, the small ordinaries is a much more diverse market than you'd think. And if we look at large caps as an example, it's a, it's a really heavily concentrated market with about half of the market cap of the ASX 100 made up by the top 10 stocks. And we all know those businesses being the big four banks and a few commodities players and, and CSL. So you can pretty easily replicate a big chunk of that market with a really small number of holdings. But small caps, on the other hand, have a much more diversified index um, compared to compared to large caps. For, for smalls, we've got the 10 largest businesses in our benchmark only make up a bit over 10% of that index. So even though it sounds perverse, small caps is actually a much more diversified market than large caps. But that is obviously coupled with that lower liquidity. So, so it is a bit challenging from an index tracking perspective. But in terms of performance over time, the, the flip side, I suppose, of having that larger number of companies, more diverse number of companies within the small cap market is that potentially there are also more ways uh, to get hurt or lose money. Um, so I guess in, in small caps, there are more opportunities, but that cuts both ways in that there's potentially greater returns to both the upside and downside. So bringing all of that together, what that means is that if you're actively investing and do the work and make the right calls, there's definitely the opportunity for higher alpha or returns above the market in small caps um, than, than possibly other parts of the market. And I wouldn't say large caps, but maybe large caps over time. Um, but obviously there are quite a few caveats in there. Um, and I, I think that's part of the reason why coming back to fundamental analysis and, and time spent on the ground, it is quite a, uh, a laborious um, piece of work that you need to do to, to drive those returns. But there are absolutely opportunities there if you're prepared to do the work. Yeah, okay. So active active preferred over passive for that index? Uh, well, that that would be that would be my feedback. But again, flagging yeah. that I, I have a completely vested interest. <laughs> yeah, that's true, and, and I'm glad that you actually uh, you uh, you admitted that, which is which is fine. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that that does make a lot of sense. Now, what what I'm going to try and do is a Simone Biles uh, style gymnastics to bring what you're seeing uh, in in your pocket versus. Uh, versus Jody, what you might be saying, sort of broadly speaking, we'll see if this comes off, and just and we'll just try something out here. But I mean, Liam, you must so uh, Jody, chip in any time you like with regards to anything um, that that yeah. you see as appropriate. But Liam, uh, whilst you don't have a macro view, which is which is fine, and talking about um, you know the, the the bigger picture stuff isn't yours because there are, as you said, there are different people who do those things, not necessarily smarter, just different. Um, but the you must surely see the sort of the sort of companies that are are being included or at least are being pitched with their growth prospects ahead of them. So is there, yeah, any, pati yeah, is there any particular theme? I sort of, I left that hanging out there. Like I said, Simone Biles sort of flipping in the wind there, but the, um, <laughs> it, what, what, what sort of themes are you seeing being put towards you? And maybe we could sort of draw a pattern out there and see if that's aligned 
like I always give a reason for why I'm doing it. See if that sort of aligns with where potentially things are actually going or things aren't. And then see if we can match that together with the risk. The idea, and, and I'll, let, I'll just let everyone know, and then I'll ask you again. I'll let everyone know. You know that we all get BDMs pitches as as advisors, and this is sort of what we do. So so just just bear with me, guys, because uh, this will this will take half a sec. We get we get um we get BDMs and relationship managers throwing a pitch at us every now and then. The the ones that don't do a great job, you know who you are. No, you don't actually. But the uh, they're all still friends of mine. But the uh, the ones that don't are the ones that always say that their product is the best the best time to be in it, and yeah. that's not always the case, as we know, because there's a time and a place for everything that there should be. The ones that the the ones that do great are the ones that say this is what our product does. Or sorry, this is what our asset class does. Oh, no, they're, they're they are actually saying products. It's not that, but they say this is what our thing does, and and this is the time when it shines, and this is the time when it doesn't. This is the time that you should look for when this particular thing shines. So maybe uh, Liam, and and let's just see without going too specifically into it. Let's see what sure. sort of what sort of stories you're being sung. And then we'll see maybe how, they, how they're fitting into the landscape at the moment. See if we might be able to line up a, a, when when a small cap allocation might need to be overweight or underweight, and just see if we can just reach some sort of happy medium. We'll try it out and see how we go. Yeah, so, sure. It's a yeah. It, it, it's a yeah. I'll I'll just jump into it, and and that's a really really interesting question and and I suppose discussion point. Um, and and I'm interested to see how you you weave it all together as well. James. I can, but, I'm, um, I'm, I'm weaving. <laughs> we're, just, we're, we're winging it. Like I said, there's no script here. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. No, well, I, I suppose one one of the things I, I would say in terms of um, uh, small caps is that, uh, and, and I will come back to specifically address that question, but one of the things I'd definitely say in terms of small caps is that we all know it's a, it's a reasonably volatile part of the market, and, and that's why people probably, on average, would have a, a smaller allocation to small caps than they do to large caps, and a, a, amongst a, a host of other reasons as well. But volatility is a, a big part of that and it is a yeah it does move around a lot no question about it so one thing that i would definitely say is that even though you know we we try and sort of figure out where we are in the cycle or when's a good time or a bad time to invest in small caps um often those movements are so are so quick and and reasonably large that even though you know it, it is my bread and butter i live and breathe small caps um and and love that part of the market I, I find it difficult to say, you know, tomorrow or next week or next month, you know, what's going to be the the area that that people are interested in, or you know, is now a good time or a bad time. And and one of the one of the comments that um, that I recall from a, a friend at Macquarie uh, in terms of small caps is that the best way to play small caps is time in the market as opposed to timing the market. Um, mm-hmm. And and every time the market moves rapidly in one direction or the other, because it's you know most likely an equal chance of of moving in either direction yeah it's it's just an interesting case study in terms of trying to pick particularly the small cap market i i think personally is is fraught with danger and and very very difficult to time in both directions um having said all of that um probably what what uh we've started to see over the past let's say six or 12 months, um, is that as everyone's become a bit more comfortable, and again, I, I'm not professing to be a, uh, an expert on the macro side, but as everyone appears to have become a bit more comfortable with, are we in a recession or not? Is inflation going to go up forever or not? Are interest rates going up forever or not? Everyone has sort of cooled their jets a little bit and thought, all right, we're, we're in at least some form of equilibrium or, or, or you know, things aren't going to go in one direction forever where's the market sit now in terms of valuation and so what we've seen is a lot of the sectors or the you know types of businesses that we saw sold off really heavily over the past you know couple of years mainly around sort of that growth tech uh basket have have really started to come back into favor um mainly because they were so heavily undervalued um with the caveat that the business obviously had to survive. So there were questions around funding for a lot of those growthy textile businesses. As long as you were comfortable that the company was sufficiently funded, most of those businesses were starting to look reasonably cheap. So we've seen a real bounce in that part of the market. And in terms of um, probably the the final leg of that that we haven't yet seen um, is that the IPO market, which has been shut for a couple of years realistically, um, hasn't yet reopened um, anywhere near to the extent that it was open prior to COVID or or a little bit post COVID as well, 
Um, and so because a lot of people are, are nervous about the IPO market and a lot of people um, obviously have a vested interest in seeing that market reopen, um, you know, right from um, vendors or potential businesses through to investment banks and, and brokers, there's a little bit of trepidation around the IPO market in that no one wants to be sort of the, the first, you know, big deal to come through or, or if you are going to be one of those first few big deals, uh, it needs to be a good one. Um, otherwise, that window that's sort of just starting to to creak open a little bit is going to be slammed shut before we know it. So, um, so we've seen, yeah, potentially some of those growthier, more volatile parts of of small caps um, find some support over the last six or twelve months. But for me, probably the last piece of the puzzle, which hasn't really yet um, opened up or kicked off, is is the IPO market. Um, and again, as I said, there's still a little, little bit of trepidation around that market, but but it does feel like there are some businesses starting to come through to try and, and sort of squeeze that window open. Jody, chip in any time you feel uh, it's appropriate. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep on talking here. But so, no, that was a breath. I heard it. It was a breath. I'm coming in. Um, yes. I'm sitting back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, look, I, you know, we, we would agree, with Liam, with regards to, you know, timing the market is just, difficult, right? Um, and it, particularly for shorter term moves. So that concept of, you know, as we talked about earlier, people sitting on the sidelines during COVID, you know, it was a six week drawdown. If you manage to time that six week drawdown, then hats off to you. But the reality is um, what's important is having that longer term investment strategy and sticking to it. So we talked earlier about risk profiling and in what risk profiles does small cap play more of a role um, because, you know, can you tolerate the volatility of that in the allocations? However, so even though we, you know, we're not talking about short-term market timing here, what we do, um, you know, as investors is, you know, we need to think in terms of probabilities. The the future is uncertain, um, but what we want to do is stack the probabilities in our favour. And the way that you actually do that is by understanding risk and understanding valuation. So, even in a portfolio where, for example, you've got an allocation to small caps, you there are points in a market cycle where you may want to think about the degree to which you might overweight or underweight that. That's not to say you move in or out of the asset completely. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, from that perspective, that's where you start to have a look at sort of valuation, um, but in an absolute sense, but also in a relative sense. And if you look at small caps over the last a couple of years, they really have been a drag on relative performance in portfolios. And that's predominantly because they've actually had more of a valuation adjustment than a lot of the the larger caps, um, you know, both here, but also also overseas. So some of the US small caps, for example, are, are, are presenting as decent valuation opportunities. And that's because effectively we do have very narrow leadership in the market at the moment um, on a global level. Obviously, with anything that's got AI exposure, it seems to do well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so, you know, as Liam said, you don't, you know, you could go either way, but on the basis of probabilities, if an asset has had some level of repricing go through it, the probability of upside is bigger than the probability of downside. And therefore, it might make sense to start sort of allocating a little bit more in this space. And that's what we're doing at the moment in some of our high risk profiles is um, is tilting in a little bit more to the small cap area. Not just heavily, there. but just, just, uh, just tilting a little bit. Yeah, and I I do strongly concur as well from from my expertise as well of of being in or out is a bad way to go, but a little Very bit bad. more a little bit more in or a little bit more out is <laughs> is usually the way of preferring to go with it. Uh, now we're running out of time, folks, so I need to just call last bids as I call it last bids. So if there are any final points that you would like to make to our listeners, speak now or forever hold your peace. I think, you know, the, the, the key for me in sort of advice is thinking about allocating to this space is it's really important for whatever capability or manager you go with is, you know, back to sort of an earlier part of the conversation is understand what you're buying. When will it do well? When will it not? And particularly in small caps that are capacity constrained, it can be difficult to get access to good managers, et cetera. Understand that if it is actually doing what it's supposed to do, if it's doing what it says on the tin, leave it alone, even if it's underperforming. Right? Understand that it's a part of your overall strategy, etc. So monitoring the outcome relative to what you thought the outcome should be um, and how that outcome then fits in with your broader investment portfolio strategy is absolutely critical rather than trying to you know, pick the best manager on any given day because that will change day in and day out. 
It sure, it, sh- it sure will. Liam, any last thoughts, sir? Yeah, it, it definitely feels like small caps are in a, a good spot after a, a, a tough few years, and that definitely lines up with some of the emerging themes or trends that we're starting to see through the small cap market, um, which typically is where those trends like technological advancement and, and even things like AI, which is quite popular at the moment, um, where those trends typically present first. Um, so it is it is quite exciting to see that happening now. But I guess one area to look at for small caps um, is that small caps uh, typically trade ahead of where the market thinks the cycle is heading. So we usually see small caps sold off when the market's expecting any sort of economic slowdown. And then uh, small caps typically bottom when either things start to look a bit better or at least people get comfortable that things aren't getting any worse. And that's definitely what we've seen this cycle with small caps, uh, extended periods of underperformance versus large caps. But what that does feel like now is that some of the leading economic indicators we're seeing have leveled out. And at some point, that means they're going to get better in relative terms. And mm. small caps will absolutely move along with that or, or possibly even ahead of that, um, given that equity investors tend to be probably uh, perpetual optimists. Um, so it, it is beginning to feel like, even though it's it's always a bit of a nervous call to make, um, that it might be time for, for small caps to shine. Yeah, spot on. All right, well, I'm going to wrap it up there because I think that we've had a really good chat and uh, I think it's there's a time to pick up your chips and push back from the table and uh, and thank the dealer uh, very much. Thank you so much, Jody Fitzgerald, Head of Institutional Portfolio Management and Solutions. Not a mouthful at all uh, for Morningstar. <laughs> thank you. And Liam Donahue, Principal and Portfolio Manager at Lennox Capital Partners. Thanks, James. It's been a pleasure. No worries. If anyone wants to know, no problem at all. If anyone wants to know more about any of the uh, the things that we've discussed here, head to the Ensemble platform, uh, go in and check it out. Um, everything will be linked to it. Uh, check out Fedante Partners, check out Lennox Capital Partners, obviously check out Morningstar. Uh, my name is James Whelan, Investment Manager at VFS Group, and you have been listening to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll catch you next time. 